He's the Nobel Peace Prize winner who's also accused of covering up war crimes. I'll challenge former Colombian president Juan Manuel Santos. And we'll also discuss his fellow Nobel Peace laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi, who's been defending her government against accusations of genocide this week at The Hague. Juan Manuel Santos, former president of Colombia, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Your country is the latest in Latin America to be the scene of anti-government protests. We're now three weeks into these demonstrations where hundreds of thousands of people have taken to the streets. The president, Ivan Duque, has declared the first curfew in Bogota in nearly four decades. He's put the military on the streets. At least one protester has been killed, dozens injured. Given you recently suggested that the Chilean government has overreacted to the protests there. Do you think your country's government, do you think Colombia has overreacted as well? Um, yes. By declaring a curfew, I think uh, they overreacted. And putting the military on the, on the street, uh, in my opinion, is also an overreaction. When people uh, are going out to protest in Colombia, they're protesting mainly because of corruption issues, uh, because of income inequality. Those are not overnight developments, are they? You left the presidency just 16 months ago after eight years in power, a period in which Colombia remained one of the most corrupt and unequal countries in the world. So a lot of this discontent is on you, is it not? Uh, no. Uh, we made a tremendous advance in terms of fighting against corruption. Um, if you uh, get the list of the measures that we took uh, day after day, month after month, year after year, you can see that we advanced tremendously in the fight against corruption. I even personally co-chaired the World Summit, the first World Summit that was held in London uh, against corruption. And uh, all the multilateral and the analysts have acknowledged the fight that we have had against you corruption. You say that, but however, you say have, that, but Transparency however, I, International. I have to recognize. Transparency recognize International says your country still, fell 20 spots from 78 to 99 on your watch. Between 2010 and 2018, Colombia dropped 20 ranks in the Transparency International uh, Corruption League. About, uh, and there's a very, very clear explanation about that. Because we took measures, like, for example, every single contract that the government uh, signed must be made public. And so we were able to uh, take corruption out of the secrecy it had been for many, many decades. And people started to see the corruption that was there uh, for a long time. So the perception, yes, uh, the perception of corruption increased, but precisely because of the measures that we took. Of course, globally, you are best known for securing the peace agreement with the Marxist FARC rebels that ended uh, 50 years of civil war in your country and for which you were awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize three years ago. But today, current Colombian president Ivan Duque is dismantling parts of that agreement while a prominent FARC commander who helped negotiate it with you Ivan Marquez now says it's time for a new armed struggle. So is your deal dead? And did you get the peace prize too soon? No, it's not dead. On the contrary, as the commander of the FARC has said, 95% or more of the people who demobilized are with the agreement. They're complying with the agreement. Uh, the agreement uh, uh, was very successful. After less than a year, what you call the DDR, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration, had already been finished. The, the challenge here is that this agreement has been the most uh, comprehensive and the most ambitious agreement ever negotiated anywhere in any country. And we are struggling and doing the best to fulfill what we agreed. So you're not worried when you hear Ivan Marquez of FARC say in August in a video that it's time for a new phase of the armed struggle. That doesn't worry you? No, it doesn't worry me because he has no people that are behind him. He went for reasons that everybody knows. He was accused of being of committing crimes after the signature of the agreement, and uh, it doesn't worry me, no. And 
Since the FARC left their territories in the south under the terms of your deal, hundreds of indigenous and left activists and civilians have been killed by paramilitary forces, by other rebel groups. That's not what peace is supposed to look like, is it? Hundreds of people dead. Nobody promised that Colombia would be a paradise after the signature of the peace. There is always, in every peace process, a backlash. And uh, we are suffering that backlash. The uh, drug trafficking, which is not Colombia's fault, it's the fault of the world, the demand in the United States, in Europe, uh, the drug trafficking continues. And the drug traffickers were very worried precisely because one of the points of the agreement was to stimulate the voluntary substitution of coca uh, plantations for legal plantations, that, and they would run out of raw material. And so they have been killing some of the promoters of these uh, voluntary substitution. Also, uh, we have been, we were very aggressive in giving the land back to the peasants that was taken uh, away because of the violence. And uh, lately, some of the landowners, the paramilitaries and drug traffickers who took illegally this land were very worried that uh, the process will uh, eventually get to them and take their land away. So there are various uh, sources of uh, these uh, uh, murders, and the government has a big responsibility here on stopping them, because uh, any government must stop any kind of assassination. With the benefit of hindsight, do you regret the way you tried to formalize the peace deal with the FARC, first pushing it in a referendum that you narrowly lost in 2016, and then pushing it through the legislature without public approval in a referendum? Some would say you opened the door to the current Colombian president's anti-peace deal platform by doing it in that way. I followed what our constitution and our constitutional court said. If you lose the referendum, don't go back to the people. Use the traditional and established procedure in the Constitution. That was a ruling of the Constitutional Court, and that is exactly but did you have to do a referendum in the first place that you then lost, undermining your deal and you? I promised the Colombian people at the beginning of the process that, we, that I would do a referendum, and I wanted to fulfill my promise, yes. But hold on, that sounds very um, instrumentalist. You wanted to do a referendum, presumably because you wanted the approval of the people. The people didn't give it to you, but you rammed it through anyways. But a new uh, agreement, and that's what the Constitutional Court said, you must renegotiate an agreement. I asked the leaders of the no vote to come to uh, uh, the table, uh, let's renegotiate uh, this agreement. They, they put on the table 59 changes, 59 points. We accepted 56. So we had a new agreement, and the Constitutional Court had established very clearly that if you have a new agreement, you can uh, go ahead, but not through a referendum, but through the normal channels, which is the Congress. And yet the current president, Mr. Duque, was elected to office running on a pledge to dismantle parts of that agreement. So obviously, you didn't do that great a job of getting the Colombian public on board. If so soon after the deal, they're voting in a guy who's going to dismantle the deal. But you, uh, you uh, are not uh, uh, taking into account that in the past elections three weeks ago, all the candidates that were for the agreement for the yes vote were the ones who won in the uh, mayors of the cities and the governors of the states. So that was a ratification that the people are with the peace process. They want to Except have for the, the president. peace process implemented. Except for the current well, the president. president. Quite a big figure, I would argue, president. in Colombia. Well, the, the president is now, he realized that he has to uh, implement the, uh, the peace process uh, by because of many factors. One of them is because it's in the Constitution, and the Constitutional Court said that for the next three presidential uh, periods, or three, the next three governments, they must implement the peace process. This peace process was very, very ambitious. We, we, we put, we established uh, uh, some some uh, points that will take about 15 years to to fulfill. So we're we're advancing, and we're advancing with the normal problems that any peace process, especially so complex as this one. But I am quite satisfied that many, many 
thousands of lives have been saved. The FARC is no longer the biggest, oldest, strongest guerrilla group in the Americas. It is now a political party, and that's what a peace process is all about. The Nobel Committee gave you the Peace Prize in 2016 for your struggle for peace in Colombia. But the year before you won it, in 2015, Human Rights Watch put out a report covering your tenure as defence minister between 2006 and 2009, in which thousands of civilians were killed uh, by Colombian security forces, who then dressed up their corpses as guerrillas in order to boost the FARC body count and get themselves promoted. That so-called false positive scandal happened on your watch, didn't it, Juan Manuel Santos? You uh, are now distorting exactly what happened, because you know very well that I was the one who stopped that. I changed the military doctrine, and everybody here acknowledges that. But you stopped I something had, that happened uh, on your watch. It also happened in, during your period as defense minister. It, it, it happened at the beginning of my watch, and I stopped it, and it went down to zero. I stopped the false positives. So don't bring here false information. You're saying that Human Rights Watch called these false positives one of the worst episodes of mass atrocity in the Western Hemisphere in recent decades. You say you stopped it, and yet no one senior was ever held to account. Just a few hundred low-level soldiers, no generals, no military commanders, no politicians have ever been held to account for thousands of deaths in your country. Thousands. That's not true. Uh, generals are now in the transitional court and they are uh, being judged because of the false positives. You say it's not true, but when you were president, you made one of the commanders of the 4th Brigade, who's accused of being behind some of these killings, uh, you made him the country's top military officer. How is that not impunity? Uh, who are you talking about? Uh, General Juan Pablo Rodriguez Barragan. When he was uh, the commander of the armed forces, he had nobody had any accusations against him. Uh, what happened afterwards, and nobody has uh, made him responsible for the false That's not true. You said nobody... That's not true. Uh, Human Rights Watch says at least 28 alleged extrajudicial killings by 4th Brigade troops when General Juan Pablo Rodriguez Barragan commanded it. In 2014, he was I'm made saying, the country's top military official by you. No. He was the commander of the armed forces, and when he was the commander of the armed forces, nobody had accused him of any uh, thing wrong. It was afterwards that... So what did you emerged. do? When you saw the Human Rights Watch report in 2015, what action did you take against any of the generals they named? I... I uh, um, when I discovered the false positives, I brought... I uh, brought down the commander of the... of the... of the army and many more generals. Uh, as I tell you, I don't know why you don't want to accept this. I was one, the one responsible for finishing the false positives. Why do you insist on denying that? I'm not denying it. I'm just wondering, at the time, you did remove the heads of Army, Air Force, Navy, but you said it was a routine change. You didn't say it was punishment for the false no, positives. No, sir. That's that, what the that Telegraph newspaper true. quotes you as saying no, in 2015. That is not true. So you that removed them true. as punishment. I, you removed them as punishment for being involved. Yes, Did yes, you prosecute and, and, them? And I removed it against... against they, afterwards, they are now in, in the process, in the, in the judicial process. They are now being The heads of Army, of Navy and Air Force on your watch. No. Navy and Air Force, no. The head of the Army. Is now being prosecuted as a result of your decision making? Yes. OK. Uh, as a result of the process, yes. Just looking at your part of the world, it seems beset by political chaos these days. On the left, you have Evo Morales out in Bolivia in what some call a coup, uh, pressure on Maduro to step down on Venezuela. On the right, you have conservative uh, former president Macri of Argentina beaten last month in the election. You have protests in Ecuador, in Chile, in Colombia. As a former national leader looking at your region, what do you think the political future holds for South America? Well, it's not only in South America and in Latin America. You go to France, you go to Lebanon, you go to Iraq, you go to Hong Kong. There's protests all around. In the case of Latin America, there are some common denominators, which is inequality, corruption, and something that we are seeing very clearly, uh, the success of the region in fighting poverty have brought many, many people out of poverty into the middle class, and their expectations have increased geometrically, and the uh, governments have not been able to keep up 
with these expectations. And so the people are going to the streets and protesting. In the case of Colombia, the peace process has also, in a way, liberated many people that be before were afraid of going to the streets because they would be uh, uh, signaled or accused of being terrorists or being with uh, the guerrillas, and now they feel free. And if you go to France, you see uh, other reasons, and if you go to Hong Kong, you see other reasons. And on Colombia specifically, given the protests, given a president trying to dismantle your deal, given the violence we discussed, are you an optimist about Colombia's future? I still am an optimist. Uh, I think the president is now understanding uh, that he has to change uh, many of the things he's doing. Among them, he has to uh, uh, to, to fulfill uh, the promises that were made for the peace process, to implement the peace process. He has to be much more aggressive on his social policy. And that's what uh, they're now discussing. But uh, I am an optimist uh, because Colombia has always been a country where, going back to the institutions, have uh, strong institutions that have been able to cope with these type of crises. Juan Manuel Santos, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. This week at The Hague, the Nobel Peace Laureate and de facto president of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, defended her country's military against allegations of genocide as the International Court of Justice began its hearing into the abuses against the Rohingya Muslims. It's one of the only times a national leader has ever personally addressed a tribunal. And with hundreds of thousands of people displaced, Suu Kyi is facing massive pressure and condemnation from the international community. But can the UN's top court really bring justice for the Rohingya? Can it put an end to the violence in Myanmar? One of the first people to accuse the country of genocide was Meng Zani, the Burmese scholar and activist who's lived in exile for more than 20 years and who knows Suu Kyi personally. He joins me now from London. Uh, Meng Zani, thank you for joining me on Upfront. For years, we've seen extensive evidence of killings, crimes against humanity, forcible displacement. And now this week, Aung San Suu Kyi, Myanmar's state councillor, goes to The Hague to defend her country's military against this uh, very serious charge of genocide. You were there this week as well. Has the Rohingya crisis finally reached a turning point as a result of this historic case, do you think? I believe so. This is the, uh, you know, milestone in the uh, <clears throat> struggle by the Rohingyas themselves to get the, the crimes that they have been subjected to for the last 40 years uh, you know, recognition that, uh, you know, the crime duly deserve, uh, that they are hopeful that some semblance of justice and accountability will follow. Uh, Mehdi, this is not the only, uh, you know, the, the trial that is happening right now. As you know, the, um, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, that tries individual criminals and perpetrators of atrocity crimes, has also embarked upon full investigation. There is also independent uh, uh, mechanism that has been authorized by the General Assembly set up to record, memorialize, and uh, archive uh, any evidence of uh, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide against Rohingya, as well as other ethnic minorities. The Gambia, with the support of 57 members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, filed this case against Myanmar at the ICJ, citing violations of the Genocide Convention. Both countries are parties to the Genocide Convention. But why did the Gambia, of all countries, do this? What was the, what's the aim, what's the strategy of the OIC and the Gambia with this case? What do they want to achieve from this case? Well, there are two things that need to be emphasized. You know, Gambia, Gambia may receive uh, political, moral, and uh, material support from OIC. Uh, also, like, you know, the net, not just the OIC, because the genocide is not simply about Muslims. So this is not a Muslim issue. This is a humankind issue, yeah? And so that's why uh, the Netherlands and Canada have officially, you know, uh, issued a joint statement saying they support Gambia's case. And secondly, the Gambia team has asked for, you know, stopping any form of genocidal policies and practices, uh, allowing the Rohingyas in the modern-day concentration camps called 
uh, in an internally displaced camp. There are about 120,000 Rohingyas that have been kept in these camps since 2012 using this banner or the, the rhetoric of protective custody. But protective custody was first used by the German SS uh, in the 1940s and 30s. Isn't the problem, though, that the court can rule against Myanmar? Uh, international opinion is against Myanmar. But inside of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi and the generals have a lot of support. Thousands of people rallied in support of her before she left the country. There was even a religious ceremony held in her honor before she set off for The Hague. What's your reaction as someone uh, living in exile, looking at your country and what is happening on the streets of your country, people cheering her on, even though the rest of the world is disgusted by what's going on? Well, of course, uh, as, a per, as, as a Burmese and a Buddhist raised in that country, lived there for a quarter of the century, I am extremely saddened and at the same time outraged by what I see as the emergence of a, a Burmese society. Uh, you know, similar to what we saw in the 1930s Nazi Germany. Aung San Suu Kyi is not simply defending the Burmese military, which is only an organ of the state. Aung San Suu Kyi is there defending Myanmar as a member state and its racist society. So, so on that note, Meng, on that note then, is she there at The Hague defending the military and her country and the government and the state? Is she doing that as a puppet of the military, as some people believe she's in a tough position? Or is she doing that because she wants to do it? She's there enthusiastically of her own free will, happily defending what's going on in Rakhine State from where the Rohingya have been displaced. Well, the fact that Aung San Suu Kyi had the resolve to stay in captivity for 15 years on and off, uh, pushing for her own agenda, which we now know that is not to be human rights or protection of minorities or democratization. It's her own personal, uh, you know, personal ambition to be the head of state legally. Now she is head of state de facto. She is not a puppet. She is proactively defending, passionately and de defiantly defending the indefensible. She is fully culpable. She is criminally responsible, on a par with the Burmese generals. Here's the thing, Monk. Last time you were on this show, back in 2017, you weren't quite ready then to demand that Aung San Suu Kyi, whom you were once a supporter of, you weren't ready to call for her to step down. I believe you've since changed your mind and you've now called for her to resign. What made you change your mind and how can you be sure that her departure won't lead to full military rule returning to Myanmar? No, I'm not calling for a resign. I, I want to see Aung San Suu Kyi and the Burmese military leaders and religious leaders like Wiratu and Thedaku in the defendant's dock at the ICC, International Criminal Court, because ICJ does not try criminal matters. And Here's a question for you. Myanmar refuses to acknowledge wrongdoing. Aung San Suu Kyi has gone to The Hague and called the allegations of genocide incomplete, misleading. The Burmese government has said they will not cooperate with the UN's independent investigative mechanism. So what, in your view, is the best possible outcome of all of this, given that even a court ruling in a few years' time won't be able to change facts on the ground in terms of what's happening to the Rohingya in places like Rakhine State? Well, what we are seeing is that, you know, the ICJ tribunal has um, exposed the, uh, the full collaboration among major institutions in the country. Uh, you know, the, all the monks, the civil society actors, a majority of them, uh, including J Burmese journalists from Erawadi uh, and other outlets. So, yes, you are absolutely right. Facts on the ground are not likely to change. However, this is one of the very, very few venues for pressure, uh, accountability, and justice in an international order that is completely broken on, you know, when it comes to the wretched of the earth, the oppressed, not just the Burmese, the, the Palestinians, the Uyghurs, you know, the Syrians. Yeah. So I think in, the, in that scenario, we are looking at... Uh, a rather dismal picture, and uh, but still, as activists and advocates for human rights and uh, the, the the rights of common uh, the human uh, beings, 
We cannot give up hope. This is something that we must hold on to and build on to build a, law, a, a bigger movement. We call for boycott of Myanmar because Myanmar has turned into the equivalent of uh, you know, G Germany in the 1930s today, under Aung San Suu Kyi's watch and active leadership. Mungzani, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for coming on Upfront. And that's our show. Upfront will be back next week.